Welcome to the Private Practice Pro Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping therapists cultivate success. Here's your host, Kelly Stevens. Welcome back, everyone, to the Private Practice Pro Podcast. I'm so excited, Justin, to have you on. And I am terrible in introducing people, so I always say you have to introduce yourself. So tell us who you are, where you're sitting right now. Obviously, I can see that you're in your office, but if anyone's listening to this on podcast um, and not on YouTube, then they're going to need to know where you are. So tell us who you are and where you are. Yeah. So my name is Justin Gillespie. I am based just outside of Metro Detroit um, in Michigan. Uh, today, I'm recording in my office here in Livonia, Michigan. We're actually getting ready to move um, from my own practice okay. into Plymouth, Michigan. So for anybody who knows where the hell that is, um, it's basically right between Detroit and Ann Arbor. Um, so that's kind of where I'm located. Um, I'm a therapist for ADHD, and I also help uh, fellow therapists and social workers um, and other degrees and whatnot, help them level up their careers as well as get themselves into business ventures, private practices of their own, things of that nature. Because unfortunately, this field does not pay, especially when you first get started and get into like the agencies. So yeah, and I have ADHD and I found out Kelly has ADHD. So we're going to be talking a lot. We're going to talk about that. You know, it's funny. I don't talk about it very much and not because not for like any shame. Re- like it just doesn't come up. Yeah, I guess. And I was diagnosed in my 20s, not as a kid, even though I for sure should have been. Um, So it just doesn't come up that much. But I feel like we've had a couple episodes with good friends of mine who also have ADHD. And there's people on my team who have ADHD. And when we get two ADHD therapists together, um, it's a wild ride. So I feel like we're just going to go on this podcast. Like we're going to it's kind of like how every one of my sessions go because it's like because my whole population's ADHD, ADHD is <laughs> like my whole thing. Um, it's really cool because I actually have fidget toys pretty much everywhere for my clients and myself, and so I'm always playing with something like this. Uh, this is my stitch one. Um, I'm obsessed. Oh my with gosh, stitch. I've never seen that. Yeah, my wife got it for me. I think for Christmas like two years ago, and I've been absolutely in love with it. But yeah, during does your wife have ADHD? You what? Does your wife have ADHD? Yes, she does, actually. <laughs> so it's a fun time over here. But um, yeah, I'll be playing with this in sessions. And that's actually, you know, this, I mean, okay, obviously, this isn't the main reason I went to, you know, private practice work and whatnot. But like, you know, working in agencies, I noticed that people automatically just look at me a little bit differently because I do things a little bit differently. I kind of beat to mm-hmm. my own drum, essentially. Um, and so they would look at something like this and they'd be like, that just looks so unprofessional. Um, my clients actually love it. Like, and I, and I offer them a little fidget toy and they just go at it and we're just having a fun time. And I think I got a whole box of them recently and I can't, I should have brought it today, but I completely forgot. But like, there's like a hundred of them in here and they have a few, um, like kind of ones like, what are these poppets, fidgets? I don't know what these are called, but like, I love they it. have one that looks like a PlayStation controller. And I'm like, I want to play. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah. I saw uh, a TikTok the other day that was, of course, here we are already in an ADHD spiral about fidget toys, that someone took their poppet, okay, mm-hmm. and then they put berries in each poppet hole, and then they covered it in yogurt and froze it and made like a berry frozen bar out of their poppet. That's amazing. I know. We can make one. They okay, now we're going to have to go back and drive. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So here's, first of all, what I want you to lay out for us. I want you to tell us like what the kind of structure of your practice is right now. So are you solo? Do you have other people who work with you? Where do you, you know, do you share office space? Like give us kind of the logistics mm-hmm. of your practice. Yeah. So right now in this present moment, I'm a solo practitioner. Uh, me and my wife own, uh, both own it. So my wife actually does come some of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, she's finishing up her MSW degree. So she kind of oh, does right. things like. Like she looks over my post, she looks over design stuff, things like that, that she can do. And now that she's graduating in a few weeks, she's actually going to take on another role. We're trying to figure out what we want her to do with that. But she takes a lot of behind the scenes stuff for me, which is really awesome. And then um, for me, I am the content creator, the therapist, the clinical director, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we also have a medical bill or two. So pretty much it's just me right oh, now. Right. Um, I have, I'm actually renting office space starting in June. So we're expanding into that. The office you see right here is my group practice that I'm a part of right now. So I'm in the transitional period, so to speak. Right. Right. So I'm kind of, I've been at this group practice since late 2021. And the cool thing about this group practice is they did not offer a no, um, offer. I shouldn't say offer for that, but, uh, they didn't give me a no compete to sign. So I can bring all my people over. 
Um, and it was awesome too, because a lot of my people that I have through here before I really started doing stuff for my practice, um, I ended up bringing on from TikTok that were finding me anyway. So yeah. I did a lot of content over there. It's, I do some content on Instagram and most of my people anyway are just my own people regardless. So, right. Yeah. And I feel like we should have mentioned that in the beginning, like TikTok is your jam. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think we met through TikTok or we met somehow through some of social media. Um, and I would say the thing that I noticed about you on TikTok more than many other people is I do feel like you're unapologetically yourself on TikTok. Would you say? Maybe not. But I feel I like you are very honest about you. I, yeah. So I will say that. So one of the tips that I give for content creation on TikTok, what you see on there versus kind of what you're seeing here. Um, one of the things I tell people, which this is something that I actually coach other therapists on. It's not something I promote actively, but I do offer coaching services for things like Instagram, TikTok, things like that. You want to create a character of yourself, but you want it to be an authentic character of yourself, right? Yeah. So how I learned this, I'm a big pro wrestling fan, right? So there's lots of, for those who uh -huh. do not, I'm going to give everyone a big secret here. If you don't know anything about pro wrestling, it's scripted. It's fake, right? We all know this, right? Cool. Okay. So you have... You know, I didn't necessarily know. I feel like I learned this from you on TikTok, but anyway, keep going. Yeah. So... So in pro wrestling, they have everybody who is kind of like they play characters, right? Essentially, if you pay right. attention to how it's laid out in pro wrestling, if you watch a couple of shows, you'll figure out very quickly. It's like adult anime or it's like, you know, like the Marvel heroes or something like that. Right. They have like a different person's playing something and it's not just like a fighter usually, right? Right. So the idea behind that is that they have to take their own personalities and up it up by about 10. That's what I do over on TikTok. I have a lot of energy. I have a lot of things I pre present. But it's me basically on 10. It's not. So I think that people think that that's you in daily life because a lot of people come to my office and they think it's going to be this crazy thing, which is great because it's like, <laughs> oh, that's eye catching. But then they come to me and they're like, oh, this person's actually like a legit professional. But he also. Oh, my God. I would have maybe assumed that, too, I think. Yeah. So but I, I, mean, I still come to work with, you know hoodies and sweatpants so it's not like it's completely gone when they come here but i have a lot of fun i'm unapologetically myself there when i'm happy i show i'm really happy when i'm pissed off i yeah. show i'm unapologetically god that was bad pissed off i can't even speak right. today my god um when i'm mad you sad whatever you see it and you see it like on full display in that moment right and right. that's something i really encourage people to do when they are putting themselves out there on any sort of platform is really show yourself because they think we're done with the days where you could just post an instagram graphic of like a canva piece where it has like a nice little sunset in the background you have some cute cursive quote and people are like yeah i want to work with them that's done now like right. we're in the era of authenticity right now yeah and i think especially when you work with younger people you know, when you work with like the under 30 crowd, especially, mm -hmm. you know, I I see that more and more that like the more honest some therapists are. And I th I think I should say it this way. I also feel like you're honest while still being professional. Yes. You know, I mean, it's not like you're on there like, you know, what I, I can't think of what it would be like super unprofessional, but I don't even want to think about what that would be. But, you, you know, know I, crazy. Feel like I got fired from my job for professionalism and I have a feeling it was from TikTok and I don't know why to this day. Because they knew Wait, all the really? tech Tell us about that. Yeah. So, okay. So before I say this, I need to let everyone know I don't have an ax to grind with this company. I just want people to, in fact, I feel like they did me like the biggest favor in the world. Because well, let's just not name them. I mean, just don't tell anyone you the name what? of the company. Well, you can just choose not to name them. Just, oh, yeah, you don't yeah, have to yeah. 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 So I have, yeah, I have no like ax to grind with them. They're, they were actually, they, they're good people. We'll just say that. But like. They were they were a faith based organization. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. So I got there and I thought this was actually going to be my forever job. I worked there for about I think it was like four or five months or something. I really thought that was going to be my forever job because it was a clinical assessor position and I really liked it. Mm -hmm. It was simply, it was simple. It was easy. It was actually pretty ADHD friendly because everything was streamlined essentially. But it was always something new. So it was always a new person, right? That's what I liked about right. it. Um, they knew I was a content creator at that point. I was already growing on TikTok at that point. And so this, I like made sure like there were no surprises in this. Right. And so right. one day they ended up calling me in, um, during social work month, six days before my birthday. <laughs> and they were like, they let me work the whole day. And I saw people right the whole now. day. And then they were like, Hey, can you come in for a second? I was like, Oh, sure. Right. And so I came in, I was like, not expecting this like at all. And they didn't really tell me why, but they did eventually say it was for professionalism. But they wouldn't tell me why. But at that point, I was getting a couple more viral videos or some things going on. Right. I also just interviewed for a supervisor position. 
So I think there was like a mix of things happening there. So I got let go for that. I assume it had to do with my online presence, whatever. At that point, I was always still cuss, but I was cussing. I was trying other things. I was dancing. I was kind of, I think I had a twerk video once because I was just like trying to figure out new things to make people laugh. But I feel like, I mean, like I watch your content and as I'm thinking about this, as like somebody who's had therapist employees, there's nothing on there that would make me question your clinical ability. But I don't know. Maybe that like I'm very liberal. I cuss. I, you know, I sure. mean, I. Well, so got, maybe well, we got to remember where we work, too. It was a faith based organization, too. Right. So, so that does sometimes make you look like a little bit different. Aside from that, I enjoyed it a lot. Right. But right. I did always want to start my own private practice. I always want to do my own thing. Um, so to me, being there, what I realized was it wasn't like my dream job necessarily, but it was something that I enjoyed enough to basically settle for myself. Right. It was so at that point, yeah. I had to go and get a whole new job, which I found was very easy because I got one three days later. Um, right. I went to the interview, told them flat out, like when they were like, why do you want to work for us? I said, um, I got I lost, I had nothing to lose at this point because I was so sick of the industry as it was. Right. And I just literally was just like, I got fired and I need a job. And right. these are my credentials. And right. they were like, sure. I was like, cool. Let's go. Awesome. Right. I said, and I told myself, I'm going to be here for six months. And I got to go. I got to do my own practice. I got to go. Because I already mm-hmm. knew about this other this next organization. They didn't have a good rap. Um, it was 10 times worse than I thought. I was out of there in like six weeks. And at that point, I jumped. But I love that you were on it. Huh? I love that you were honest during the interview, though. That's amazing. I, I reached this point with myself that I was just like, I have nothing left to lose anymore. I wasn't actually ready to leave the field. I got to a point where I mean, I lost this job I liked enough and now I'm coming here and I've had bad right. experience before. I was like, I'm ready to just go into real estate. I'm ready to do something. Right. I don't know. Like this is getting ridiculous. So, but I did say, if I'm going to stay here, I'm going to do private practice. I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to do my own business. And we're going to give this a try. Right. So yeah. I got into my group practice. So there was like, I was there like super part-time already, thankfully. So I was already there. Um, and I was, was not after ready. the next job. So you yeah, had the... the- this is this is I had I had, I got hired for the group practice around the same time I got fired from the job I got fired from. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So so I was already kind of there. I didn't have enough people yet. I was there super part time. But right. I was by the time I got into this next role, I was like, I am so miserable here. I don't care how broke I am. I don't care how much more in debt I go into. I need to do something different. And so I I put my notice in and I just kind of prayed something would happen. And I knew and I told them I would I would expand I'd expand my availability. Thankfully, they got me a few people. But what was really funny is like a few days for my last day um, of that job that I was only at for a little bit. I had a TikTok go viral, which was not uncommon for me at that point. But I wasn't like actively bringing people in at that point. I just occasionally someone would email me. They'd be like, oh, hey, I saw your TikTok. Cool. I put a video up, not even related to the niche I'm in now, by the way, but it was literally all about toxic parenting. I mean, there's parents, how there's like some parents can be low key toxic, but also low key supportive. You've probably seen this video. I post it like I've 12 times. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. I milk this video to this day because right. it gets me at least 100,000 views minimum. Video got like 3 million views. Two videos. It's like, it got 40 million? No, I got 3 million. Three, three. 3 million. I was going to say, that means still 3 million is insane. If I like got 40 million, million views, like, I would be like over the moon right now. Like, you'd be like, yeah, Beyonce. Um, yeah. Okay, so it gets 3 million views. And then what happens? Um, I got 50 inquiries in a single weekend. Holy shit. Yeah, 50. So in, in the last, I think this is all was, in Michigan, all in your state, all not all in my state. So this is the first thing I learned, right? This is the right. first lesson I had to learn. You have to tailor your content to the states you're in because of your licensure. By the way, I did not think that I was going to get people from this video, just so we're clear. This was just me posting still. It was just me doing right. my group practice and me being a content creator. I'm just having fun at this point. Right. So they and, and I just happen to have like my psychology today in case someone might be a little interested. Right. So I get 50 of them in one weekend. Um, to date, that was actually back in my God, it's only been a year, actually. My goodness. <laughs> I like just realized that. So it's been I, like, know, I was thinking about like I think we DM'd on Instagram before you had a big presence on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I yeah. was, yeah. Instagram was my main thing before. I was, I was always doing like stuff in the social work scene, and I've been right. Kelly. I've been busting my ass for content. Okay, I have many. Whenever people say this fell into my lap, like I've wanted to be a content creator since I was twelve years old. 
That's literally yeah, what I've wanted to do for like, a while. I don't know content creators where, you know, I think that's like a very common misconception mm-hmm. that you, that people just create content and it goes viral. Like I have a few friends right now that are building, that are trying to build platforms and it's hard. Yeah. I mean, it's work, you know, like you're in the, in the wherever, in the studio. I was going to say, well, there's no studio here. Like you're in your house filming TikToks, filming reels, learning how to do it, learning the strategy, following people to help you figure out how to fall. You know, I mean, it's like there is strategy to it and there's business acumen to it, but people don't realize that. I think we think of like, you know, teenagers dunking basketball videos and like whatever. And that's hard too. You want to go viral for dunk shots? Probably hard to dunk a basketball. Probably harder than therapy. Probably really harder, yes. Yeah. I don't know where we're going. We're down a township. Okay, so you get 40 40 million, or not 40 million, you get 3 million views. You get 50 inquiries in one weekend. You're still, so at this point, you have quit the side job and you're just working in the group private practice, right? Yep. Yep. At that point, I, yep, I quit the job and then I'm just working in a, in a group private practice. So out of those like 50 people, I want to say 20 to 25 of them converted into therapy clients at that point. So I Amazing. created, yeah, I created a full caseload just like that. Like it was, it was pretty quick. What did your bosses at the group practice think at that point? They don't. Uh, this is such a big group practice. They don't know who we are. They 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 don't. How many they, people are in the group? You what? How many people are in the group? Like seven hundred. It's across like four states. Oh my god, we're we're not talking like a twelve person group. We're talking. No, no, no. This is like this is like a moderate size practice. Like this is a pretty big practice. So there's like a lot of people in this group. Um, so most of them are online. Um, there are people in this particular building, but yeah, they have like, they have easily, I think it's like, God, how many do they have now? I want to say they have 30 offices in Michigan and then they expand it into Minnesota, Wisconsin, and then, um, Chicago area too. Wow. Okay. That's huge. So, and you take in the group practice, what you, what insurance panels do you take? Uh, all major insurances. So I take Blue Cross Blue Shield, Blue Care Network, um, Anthem, Aetna, pretty much all of them that you would know in Michigan. I don't know what they're called in California because right. I found that all okay. the as I expand my stuff into other states because I'm doing Indiana work too. Um, I've learned that right. everywhere has a different name, even though it's the same company, and I just get so confused. It does get so confusing. The whole mm-hmm. like cross state process is wild. Okay, so at this point, you're taking all your insurances. You are full after this and then what happens yeah it's so at this point what ends up happening is i've realized like you know this is exact first of all this is exactly what i've wanted my entire career like when i got into social work um it's a whole story and a half of how i ended up a therapist in the beginning with because i want to be a therapist there was like two things i wanted to be when i was actually around 12 13 years old i want to be a therapist and I wanted to be a content creator because I think everyone around my age wanted to be on YouTube and stuff like that. Then, really? um, and you said what? I didn't know any at that. How? Wait, how? Can I? How old are you? I am twenty nine. Okay, so I'm not that much older than you, but I don't feel like anyone I knew. Well, maybe people were on YouTube. I can't remember. I don't know. I wasn't cool enough, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, and, so I I grew up around like when I was in high school, MySpace was just dying down, and then Facebook was really coming into its own along with Instagram, and then YouTube really started taking off. Okay, well I'm a little. I guess I like my. I didn't get Facebook until I think I was a freshman in college, and Instagram didn't come out until I was after college. So I guess I'm like on the further end of that cut. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I had, I had a Facebook since like I think middle school. I think so. I've been online yeah, for forever. I'm old then, I guess. Okay, anyway. <laughs> you're, you're you're in we're that in you're, you're in that mid-30s. borderline like cut off age where it's like I'm. You're only like a couple years, but then you're like, wait, what's that? You know what I mean? It's like I weird... guess I'm actually like six or seven years, but the um, I'm like deep in millennial land. There's no part of me that's Gen Z. You know, like I'm for sure in millennial territory I, oh, oh um, i'm like a gen z soul I, I i love gen z ears and i love what they're doing and just well, they're major they're inspirations for a lot of the stuff i even preach even on my instagram page for therapists anyway really? where the hell are we at right now <laughs> okay well this i knew this was gonna happen to us all right we were so getting on the damn we're back. Back. we were gonna well, go down an entire hole you're yeah we talked we texted about the fact that we're going down a hole all right so at the point you're full you're chugging along and now you're getting ready to open your own office. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. So life's good. I already had the LLC for it. So what I was doing with it at the time was in 2021, I filed for the LLC. Um, I was doing social work exam prep work during that time. I still do it for my business now, but I've actually tailored it toward my therapy niche where it's like social workers who need to pass our exam that have like ADHD or neurodiverse needs. So it's kind of like marketed kind of towards that. So I usually use that money just to fund the exam. You what? You tutor people who take the exam or what do you do for? I do. I do a group class. So what I do is I offer for an affordable rate. I offer a four hour class of here's what you need to do. These are the priority of what you need to do. I just lay this out and go run with it. And most people, what they end up doing, and I also include a section too, by the way, of like, if you need additional resources, here's how much this one costs. This one's great for this learning style. This is how you learn. This is what I recommend. Boom. A lot of people tell me what they end up doing is they end up passing this class that I do every few months um, just from taking my class and then maybe finding free stuff on YouTube because now they know what they need to actually study for. Right, Um, Right. And I think that's part of with the ADHD brain. We don't know where to start, so we just don't. So if I can literally just lay out, this is where you start and just go with it, then we can usually get ourselves kind of going a little bit. Uh, right. But what, so what I do with those classes is I offer it super cheap because I want to pack a room. I want to pack a room. I want to get emails and I want, and ironically, actually through these classes, I've also gotten therapy referrals because they're, it's a bunch of therapists and some of them have not been the yeah. some license and they're like, Hey, uh, I want to send you someone. I'm like, Oh, dope. Cool. Right. Yeah. Great. So, yeah. Yeah. So I will, so I'll do these classes like super cheap. Like the one I'm doing right now is like 10 bucks. Most of the time I do them. Wow. For like, most of them I do pay what you can. I get like 400 people right. in these classes. I'm like, let's just go. Wow. Let's crank right. this out. I make anywhere between like for a four hour run that has very little promotion. All I got to do is put it in a Facebook group. I make anywhere between like $600 to like $2,000 for like four wow. hours of speaking. And there you go. Yeah, and I great. take that money and I reinvest it back into the practice. Right, right. So that's kind of how we got started. We started with that initially. And then as I went, hey, I've always wanted to do a practice. What if I use some of this money to start funding it back in? So that's how I've right. like paid for insurance credentialers and like started upgrading some of my equipment. And now now I have an office space. So I've kind of like built it over time. Right. How it goes. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of how we ended up here. I mean, that's huge. I think like, you know, it. It's interesting because I think that so often as entrepreneurs and as therapists, the concept of like you start small, right? So you're making $600 to $1,200 on a four hour thing and you just keep putting that money back into your business. You know, the temptation is always like, I'm going to buy a pair of jeans. Well, it'd be very expensive pair of jeans, but you know what I mean? Like it's like, but you just keep chipping away at it. And it's shocking to me always like how much it grows, you know? Does it make sense? Like my first product, like I taught workshops and things like live prior to having any like um, Instagram presence. I just taught live workshops. It's like 30, 40 bucks. Come learn about private practice. And then you just kind of balloon out from there. You know, I I love workshop and I love workshops, too. It doesn't really matter what it is because it allows me in a really structured way to kind of actually let my ADHD brain run with it. But it's also a way that it's something I've already created. So I put the ADHD, like what you see right now on the paper, or, well, not paper, but like, you know, you make a presentation or whatever and right, right. whatever. And then like you just let it flow. And then eventually you just do you just rinse and repeat. You just keep saying the right. same things over and over and over again. Um, and then you make a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand dollars, and then you reinvest that into your office space, your equipment, your right. accountant, your whatever you need, like just literally reinvest it back in. I actually told myself too that for the first three years, um, I'm probably not going to pay myself. I just went in with saying like, this is going to be like my my hobby, right. so to speak. And I'm just going to watch it grow and just kind of see your what practice? happens. Huh? Your practice or your... The, the business as a whole. So like... Okay, now I have to explain this because this doesn't connect. So let me explain this. So in 2019, here's how I even ended up with the idea for the practice. I've always wanted to do a practice, but I kind of was in the stereotypical of like, oh, I'm a therapist and we help everybody type shit. You know what I mean? So we're just going to open a practice and say, come one, come all. Right. Well, that doesn't work very long or it gets really stressful. Right. So I was talking to my colleague at another job I had. I have so many jobs, by the way, that I'm so embarrassed to admit. But anyway. But this was at a telehealth center I was working at. And I was talking to one of the nurse practitioners who also has ADHD. And I was saying, like, you know, this job is awesome and it's great for what they're doing for these people because it was a it's a web based app. Um, 
and things like that for treatment um, and whatnot. Um, and I was like, this is really cool. It's really integrated. It's awesome. But why don't we have anything like this for ADHD? Right. You know what I mean, like, wh- why is there no why is there no even specialty centers for ADHD? You know what I mean? Right. And so in true ADHD fashion, as we were talking, that's that thought clicked. And you're like, here we go. Let's make it, it happen. It clicked. And I sat on it right. for like three years and I business planned it three separate times. And right. just, but it stayed up here. But this is what I find. 90 percent of an ADHD is work. It's all in here until we right. actually produce something out finally. So right. it kind of t- when I opened my business in 2021, the original concept was more so just for like social work exam, whatever. It was, I, I was going to yeah. be a social work coach, basically. Right. And then as I realized as I did this more, I was like, I'm not really feeling this. But hey, I have this whole idea over here. Why right. do I do what I'm doing right now? That's making me a little bit of money, reinvest it and start growing this. So it kind of right. came back. And now in 2023, two years later after that, like, like, here we are. Right. So as where you're sitting today, do you are you working one job or where? Tell us. I want to know the jobs. What are you doing? Like on a week to week basis, what are you doing? Week to week basis right now, I am in my group practice and then I'm also at my own practice. So my own practice to date has about, I believe, like 15 people in it. And next month is expected to be about 22 the following month, because most of these people are my own in the group practice as I'm transitioning, the following month in June, especially when we open our office, uh, I'm probably going to have about 50 people. So I will be working. 50 on your case. So, so how many people do you see a week? A week, it kind of varies. So I see anywhere between 18 and 22 people a week. And then there's some people who are biweekly. And then I have quite a few who are monthly. Yeah. So it's like you're not seeing 50 a week. I was going to say at 50 a week, no, just got to have an intervention because that's all I have some friends who are at 50 a week and I just don't I I can't understand. I don't like I, I, I wouldn't be able to function. Well, what's really funny is like I can't like, I, OK, I could do 50 a week, but I realize it, when you think about it. Um, so for me, I guess I need to explain my business model because right now we're talking about where I'm at. I want to talk about kind of yeah. where I'm going, where this makes sense. Tell right? us. Tell Where are you going? I want to basically be between Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio. I want to have right. anywhere between 50 and 100 ADHD specific contractors under me. And I right. want to have two to three doctors per state, at least minimum. Right. That's what I want the end goal to kind of be. And I want it to be an integrative app that you can do this all in with courses and community and all that awesome. kind of stuff. That's the long term goal. That's and the one. all for ADHD. All for ADHD and neurodiversity. Right. So we do take some people with um with autism and things like that too. But right. mostly it's ma- mostly my branding's under AD- the ADHD realm. That's amazing. So basically they would get like they they would come and work with somebody near one of your offices and they would get a psychiatrist who's doing meds, I, I'm assuming, and then a therapist who is doing therapy and then an app which is like helping them manage what? So so the app could have like access to be able to like similar platforms like you'll see them in bigger telehealth platforms too, right? So you could be able to maybe text your therapist or send a message to your psychiatrist so that way they have it for next session. Right. And then um in the you know in this era what I'm finding a lot of people especially in the ADHD realm they do want a hybrid of things. They want in-person therapy because they think they work better with it. They tend right. to focus better because they're not in an environment but sometimes with schedules, you want to do your telehealth therapy. Now, for me, I want to do both just because I personally, I'm someone that loves going to an office. I've learned I don't yeah. like driving to an office, which is why my new office is like a mile from my house. I can walk right. to my nice little downtown and it's really fun and it's exciting. It's going to bring yeah. my health too, right? Right. So, but like, I notice a lot of people, they do want that in-person experience, but I absolutely love doing telehealth because one right. of the things I do with my ADHD clients is a lot of times we have trouble cleaning our houses. And so right. I will have them like take me through their house on camera and I'll, oh, be, like, and I'll be like, what's that doom pile? What, what's the purpose right. of that? How did that happen? Right. And they realize, oh, it's two doom piles that like right. made sense. Well, this yeah. one t- tipped over into one and now it's just a right. mess. And so you like get to see their how their thinking process. Yeah, I love that about Tello. Hey, therapists, are you listening to the show and thinking, I really want to launch my own private practice, but I have no idea where to start. Make sure to check out Kelly's Private Practice Roadmap course. 
In the course, Kelly gives you the exact steps you need to open your own thriving practice. You can find the link below in the show notes. I think for a lot of people, when they hear somebody saying, this is my five-year plan, this is my 10-year plan, I'm just going to go do it, that sounds like courage, you know, or it sounds like sometimes people feel like they can't just say to themselves, I'm going to do it. So what do you think, how did you get there? You know, like how do you, what is it about you where you're like, all right, I'm just going to do this? Yeah, I think I think that answer has a lot of layers to it. So I think the first one is definitely re- recognizing that with my ADHD and then just me in life in general, I have fucked up so many times, like more times than I really wish that I would like to admit, right? So for me, right. I have gotten myself out of situations before. I've been able to pay rent before. I've been able to feed right. myself before. I did it all right. on my own. Now I have a partner who's my wife who's working on top of it. And she's right. endorsed. Yeah, I go into business. So she's kind of co-signed right. for the shit storm that this is going to be, right? So <laughs> so I, I call her my number one investor, actually, <laughs> So in so many ways. So to me, like, I feel like not doing this is ironically more scary because I I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I know working for agencies, working for community mental health, it made me miserable. It, it was it was groups of people I was working with that didn't understand how my brain worked and they didn't want to understand. And that's the difference. Right. I don't care if you'd understand or not, but if you don't want to understand me or you don't want to come to somewhere, that's where I have right. a problem. That's why I actually serve the clients that I do because there are a lot of people who are misunderstood from their careers, yeah. from school, from whatever, right? So that's like the main thing. Uh, the other part right. is I have a business coach. And I have somebody who she's really in my corner. I absolutely love her. Her name is Kelsey Warren. Shout out to her. She's a former social worker and everything. She, you might know send her. Send me her link. We'll, uh, link you what? In the show. I said, send me her link and we'll link it in the show notes. I will. I will. So she's known on Instagram as the Seamless Coach. She is absolutely awesome. And I absolutely love her to death. And she's actually one of the reasons why I'm in the position that I'm in today. Because she gave me permission to like these things I felt like I had to do on my own. She kind of like helped right. me look at my finances and looked at what I'm doing and kind of strategically invest a little bit more and was like, you can outsource this and this yeah. thing that you're trying to find somebody for, you're good at. So why don't you just do this and outsource this? And you know, she did right. a little rearranging for me. So it sometimes it takes like, amazing. it just takes some like arranging and just putting some things together um, right. to really make the path a little bit clearer. Um but yeah, like I feel like also for me, the the third part of that answer would probably be just with me having ADHD and just having how my spirit works. I've always been a visionary anyway. I've always been able to put the puzzle in my head together. I just haven't been able to put the puzzle physically in person, but I've always seen what I've always wanted. So for right. me, just not trying it is way scarier and way more disappointing than just saying, oh, well, it didn't work out the way you did it this way. Because at least even if I do fail at this, then it's like, well, I've learned from that one. I can start another business in another year if I had to. Right. Yeah. I mean, I feel the same way. I, I am more afraid of going back to working for someone else. Although I would do it if I like was in a phase of life where I needed to. Um, but to me, the for me, if that feels like monotony, like I like the excitement of betting on myself you know, rather than just following in a system, um, which I feel like is often what I was asked to do as an agency therapist. Um, so I fear more that than the the failure, you know, like if I fail, you know, f- like, for example, with Private Practice Pro, when I used to have like five followers and they like no one was I was talking to crickets. I was like, well, whatever. I'm talking to cr- no one cares. You know, like if I fail, I fail. No one will know, you yeah. know, um, versus living every day feeling like I could do this thing, but I'm too afraid to. Yeah. That's, I'm more afraid of that. Mm-hmm. You know, you know what I just talked to my therapist about? And I actually told my wife this recently too. I w- just processed this the other day and I was just like, I am like with this journey, I am the happiest, saddest, scaredest, angriest, most anxious I've ever been. But when I worked for community mental health, my emotions were not on 10, but I was grade A miserable. Like I was like, yeah, I was living, but I was yeah. miserable, but I wasn't miserable to that point where it's like you can obviously see it. So I was like, oh, just keep trying for me. I'd rather deal with this 
because my emotions, ironically, they're more clean cut. So when I'm anxious, yeah. I can actually clear I did. Oh, I'm anxious. I just need to do. I'm this. having anxiety about this thing. I can work through. It. Yeah, yeah. I'm that having totally- anxiety over this, so I can work through this. But like, what when you get happy over on the side of the things, you get really happy. And I think that's a yeah. And I think it could be a dangerous place to be too if we really want to go deep into it. But I do think also that. I just love that feeling and I just love being, like you said, I like to, I love to bank on myself. I love to bank on my abilities. And honestly, there's a little ego part of it. I want to prove everybody I've worked with the last six years wrong, to be real. Yeah, 100. I mean, we all have that. I have that ego yeah. part of it. Like, Anyone you know, who I, says they don't want to do that are a fucking liar. I'm telling you that right 100%. now. 100%. Like, Bill, you know, I always will say, and I, you know, we could go real deep into this, like you're saying, like I talked to my therapist about this, mm-hmm. like, for me, business building is a is a easy button to self esteem, mm-hmm. and it you know I have to work on the other buttons to self esteem versus this one because it's the one that I can control the most, and you know has to do with my own effort and whatever and my perfectionism. But but I agree with you. Like when I am successful in building a business, regardless of whether the goal of that business is to help people, and that really is my main intention, I still feel good about me. And I think it's okay to say that. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Like, I hope that all the therapists out there who are impacting their clients' lives also feel damn good about themselves for doing it because it's hard, you know? Um, And I also agree with you that, like, there are ups and downs in private practice, that it's not just, like, I'm stoked all the time and, like, I never get anxious or I never get upset or bored or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's... But like you said, you're great and miserable the whole time in your agency job. Yeah, you're just you're, yeah, you're just mildly miserable all the time. And who wants to be miserable all the time? Yeah, well, and then it impacts your other area. Like for me, that impacted other areas of my life, my health, my relationships, like everything. I just kind of felt like I wasn't doing what I wanted. And not to say that there aren't therapists who love it. I certainly have friends who love working for other people. And yeah. it's just different personality types, you know um there are amazing but, places out there too like there really are and but like the one thing i will say with my experiences is that i'm a firm believer in workplace trauma when i say workplace trauma for us for me i have when i say that i have rarely or never maybe once but like i have almost never been traumatized by one of my clients the line work they it's always been my bosses my supervisors always. our directors the fact that to this day, I sense a little bit of anxiety because I have my business email ding and I think I'm in trouble for something when I'm the boss wow. of my solo company. Does that make any fucking sense to anybody? No, but that's how real this shit is. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that can make me cry. I mean, I, I totally understand that. I think so, you know, I've worked in some really wonderful places, so I don't want to like generalize because I've right. had some incredible bosses who've changed my life, but I've also had some that really did more harm than good. And um, and I agree with you. You know, I think so often people say the work you do must be so hard working with clients. And it is so very rarely the client part that's hard mm-hmm. for at least. I mean, it's hard in a different way yeah. that you're holding space for people during a challenging time in their life. But I find you know, I always will talk to, I work uh, in a university setting a lot of the time. And I'll always tell students, like, when you go into interview at a practicum site or your first few jobs, I want you to be so eyes wide open about that supervisor. You know, are they doing their own inner work? Do they have good boundaries? What is their, you know, and it's hard to kind of ascertain some of that in an interview, but there's a lot of really bad supervisors out there. You know, and that's just the reality, I think, of our field. A lot of my friends have had bad bosses, unfortunately. There's a there's a lot of supervisors out there, too, that unfortunately they're all, they're in that position because the agency is so bad. So understaffed that someone had to be called up. And that's really sad yeah. to say. Um, a key yeah. thing that I always like even tell just my fellow social workers, I don't know how it works for on the LMFT or LPC or whatever side. But for social workers, if that person has if your supervisor or your director, because I work for directors, I have this too. If you have one of those two positions and they don't have a full clinical license, you have a limited license, there's something going on there usually. Oh, interesting. We don't have that in California. So I'm not sure what that, like in order to be like a clinical director in these here, you'd have to be fully licensed. I think partially because of the way 
our insurance billing works here. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I've I've been to places where both in Michigan and Indiana where your supervisors had limited license, your directors had limited licenses, and I found that those were the places that had the most turnover. And so that tells me right there that people were getting called up very quickly because they needed a spot fill. They needed a body pretty right. much. These are usually also like through community mental health. I always I, I call them the Medicaid mills or when they hire you, they're not looking for a person. They're looking for a licensing number type of deal. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes, they're, you know, it's not necessarily the individual clinician's fault, but they're so understaffed and underpaid and yeah. under budgeted, and, you know, I mean, all of that. So, OK, so I'm going to turn it around on you and I'm going to ask you, I want to know, because you're talking about building this big, awesome care for ADHD clients. So that also is going to require you to run a bigger staff. Huh? So what are you going to do differently for your team? Then was done for you. Mm-hmm. Well, so for me, what I kind of want to do, act, ironically, what I want to do is I want to do a similar model for where I'm in right now, because the group practice I'm in right now, I absolutely love it. Um, I don't awesome. know, to be honest, if I'm going to fully quit here until I absolutely have to or not, just because yeah. the access you have here, first of all, is amazing. You have 700 clinicians here and you have access to them in a Slack channel, right? So that's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So to me, it's like, I have all these different resources for consultation, for referrals and everything. Like if I could just right. take. Yeah. Like, Otherwise like, you'd have to pay for that. When yeah. You leave. I'm like, yeah. what if I just take like five or six people still through here while I'm still doing my own yeah. thing? And, you know, I still have that access. Right. I love maintaining that yeah. relationship with them. But what I want to do is I, I kind of want to set it up like that in time. I want to be a little bit smaller because I still want it to be more intimate. But right. I want it to be a situation where you're getting what you need out of this. Right. I want to help other therapists really grow their own practices and grow their own roster. I don't believe in, I really, especially in this field, especially when you're niched and you know your shit right. and you know you are the shit, I don't believe right. in competition. I don't believe that. So I don't care if you have a full caseload and then you're like, I want to start my own practice with all 40 Jeez. of these people. Yeah. See you, have a nice day. I hope I helped you out. That's really what I want to do. I don't want to have anyone. 100%. Any- this is one of the main reasons I wanted you on my podcast was randomly one pod or like one comment you made on my stuff about like people when people work for me eventually I want them to come and grow and if they go okay and I think this is such a huge trademark of a good boss in our field like therapists don't always have 30-year careers in one practice and I often see so many bosses and supervisors trying to keep therapists stuck in them instead of just empowering them and saying okay there's going to be another good therapist who comes our way like we build our network by helping other therapists grow and they're going to refer back to us and we're going to refer to them. And it's like, but so often people don't have that mentality, you know, and that can be a huge pitfall in certain group practices. So when there's a group practice, like look at the group you're in, you had, they have 700 people and yet you're, you're free to come and go as you leave, yeah. which is amazing. Mm-hmm. And you know, what's crazy is like, there's so many people in my field and I think I commented this on your page actually too. So some people might've seen this, but like, yeah, I like so many of my colleagues think I'm crazy for picking the practice I did because it is a bigger practice when they when they gave me the salary, it was 55 percent split, which in our area, right. 60 to 70 is like your standard, like 60 is like your bare bones right. minimum. Yeah. They thought I was yeah. insane because I turned down this right. one place that was like offering me like 75 percent. But they also right. were. You know, I interviewed for a few places. This one in particular, they were, well, first of all, when I went to the interview for them, they were really weird, which is a whole other subcont. I won't mm-hmm. get into it here, but they were just weird. But anyway, they wanted you to sign a no compete, which immediately I was kind of like in my head, okay, probably not because I'm trying to do right. my own thing and I'm making that clear. Um, they, they wanted you to pay them to do your credentialing for them. So they were like, pay, pay, pay us a couple hundred, whatever. Not only I don't have a couple hundred right now while I'm starting out um, right. because I work in community mental health, but also right. it's like, you know, like why, why would I pay that when you're about to make thousands, you're about to make right. thousands of dollars right. off of me. You're going to get this back in right. about a week. So why am I paying? Right. So this right. practice, you didn't pay for anything. They set everything up. It was super easy. Now you have relationships with the, with existing insurance providers. That, if that's a route you right. want to go for your practice, right? Right. So when yeah, you, go, you decide if you're already paneled, so that's amazing. Yeah, you're already paneled. So that's a pr- tip for people who are in the in the area. Like we do want to do insurance for your business model. Right. Um, 
uh, go into a group practice that'll actually panel you. And when you go to apply for yourself, all your records are in there. So it's right, way, that's yeah, it's way down the work yeah. for you a ton. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I went with them. The marketing, the admin, the credentialing, everything. It was tied into one. And they also provide the office space that was furnished. And they provide you everything you need. They just take a higher split rate. So I told myself, right. okay, they're going to be taking a lot of money from me. I don't want that forever. But this is a cool opportunity for me to be somewhat on easy street for this. So what right. if I just came here? Little did I know I'd get my own people, of course. But, you know, hey, you know, that happens. But at the time, I was gonna be like, I'll just take my own people from here, do my thing, and then leave with the practice and then figure out how to market from there. And also, because I didn't have that extra stress of, like, worrying about marketing, I could try different things right. without being super impulsive and then stressed out and then giving up. I was just like, okay, I could try this. I could do this video. I could go to this or that. And that's how I figured all well, this out. I mean, it sounds to me like it's setting you up to be an entrepreneur and making that strategic choice like, okay, in this next year, I could make more money, but then I'm in this company that doesn't set me up to have my private practice or I could make less money for a year and then be set up to have my own practice. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 that's that's kind of how they did it. Right. So how they did, they went in with the attitude of we don't care how long you stay, just do your thing and do whatever. Right. How my business wants to be a little bit different is I want to take that an extra step. Mine is, right. I want you to leave. You want to stay here, great. That's on you. Right. I want you to go start your own business. I want you to right. do something. Even if you don't want to be an ADHD person forever and you figure out right. another niche you like while here, I want yeah. you to take your people, do what you want, whether you're competing with me competing or not. Right. Go do your thing. And I'm going to literally, like, if you want, my, like, like how everybody has meetings on like Medicaid stuff right. or they have whatever, right? right. I want to have meetings on here's how you promote yourself. Here's how I you, love this. Yeah. I love how, it so much. Here's how you here's how you make a connection with a doctor. Here's how right. you send that letter over to where that shit looks so sweet when you get the ROI that that doctor is going to be calling you right away. And they don't call people I right away because they're busy, right? Right. Here's how you make a TikTok video or an Instagram or whatever without in a few years, right? How it's going to be eye catching and present you as the professional right. while still being yourself. That's what I want people to do. I want people to leave my practice with more knowledge on how to actually grow themselves than when they came in. I love it. And you know, I'll say the the bosses that I had that did that, because I had a couple that did, are the ones I refer to still. Yes. I send them. You know, as my business grows, I send them business or I send them therapists that need jobs or resources or I can bring them on my podcast or whatever, because they empowered me to go out and do it. So their network becomes bigger. And I mean, it's like, yeah, we could go. We could riff about this for a long time. It's going to be like a three part thing. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to like every week. We're going to. Okay, so we're going to have to wrap up. But here's what I want to know. We kind of already touched on this, but five years from now, you, Justin, where do you like, what's the goal? Where do you want to be? The goal of that would be I want to be with a team as far as work wise. I want to be with a team of at least 50 people, no more than 100, I would say, though. And as far as in my personal life, uh, well, I see myself with a few kids by then. So we're actually planning on starting that next year. And then when it's crazy with me, I know, I know it'll be really fun. Um, I want to be able to be in a position where I can pretty much just go wherever I want. So if that means, you know, next week, I just want to go somewhere. Um, which I'm almost at that point right now, actually, but if I want to go somewhere and instead of taking a week off, I can just tell my clients, Hey, um, I'm taking off next week. You want to see me on telehealth? Cause I like to do therapy from my condo great awesome right right? we can do that um but yeah as far as that those kind of things go um i really truly don't see my life much more different than it is now other than family and that i really i think for me i don't have like big extravagant things in my mind and maybe that's like a social work thing because i think it's kind of us telling us to be humble but I I just want more security and that's kind of why those are big things 50 person team like running a big team is a, I mean, I'm running like a small team and it's a lot of work. So I get it. Yeah. I just, I just want more of that security factor. Other than that, like my goal is really just to mentor people, which is why I can set my business up that way. I don't care if I 
I want to make more money, obviously, but like I if I can make a couple hundred thousand dollars, two or three hundred, I'd like I don't need to be like the you know, these other bigger organizations that make millions upon right. millions. Like I want people really to succeed. And if I can make a good living and be right in that middle zone, that I'm I'm good. I really am. Love it. I love it. I'm very confident. I already see that for you. I'm super confident in that. And so, Justin, where just tell everyone where they can find you, uh, like all your handles for TikTok and Instagram and your website. Yeah. So you can find our practice at superior-center.com. You can also find me on TikTok and Instagram at ADHD therapist underscore J. That's spelled J-A-Y. For my fellow therapists out there that really want to learn how to take their stuff up to the next level, you can also find me on my second Instagram account over at Justin Gillespie LMSW. And if I can leave you guys with this, I have one piece of advice um, that I feel like if I can leave it, right, um, that's not so generic. I was really trying to think of this earlier. Stop listening to your parents. Stop listening to your friends that are sitting here trying to doubt you and bring your dreams down or don't understand it or are scared and they're operating in a feeling of being scared. You're already scared enough. Stop listening to these people who aren't doing anything different than you are or trying to do anything different. I love that. I agree with you 100%. And it's like, listen to the people who have done it for you and have built practices, you know, so. Thank you so much, Justin. Everybody stay tuned. We're going to tune in to Ask Kelly Anything in a minute. But Justin, I will see you soon. Thanks, Kelly. This podcast is sponsored by Simple Practice. I've been using Simple Practice since 2016, which has helped me run a smooth and profitable private practice over the years. It has simplified everything from scheduling to billing, giving me a better balance between the work I'm so passionate about and the family time I'm not willing to miss out on. Check out the episode notes to get a free two-month trial of Simple Practice, my preferred all-in-one HIPAA-compliant solution. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Ask Kelly Anything, where I answer your burning private practice questions. So let's get into today's question because I love this one. This question comes from Instagram, and it's a question that I personally love answering. I don't know why, but maybe it reminds me of summer. So here it is. Hi, Kelly. I love your podcast. And I'm hoping you can answer this on air. Do you have any tips for people who are trying to launch a private practice in the summer? I'm graduating this May. Thank you so much. All right, let's answer this one. So I think the reason I like this is because I work with graduate students. And so often, you know, people are coming out of grad school And maybe they're in a state where they can launch a private practice or they're working in a group private practice right out of school, um, even under supervision, and they're pumped and excited. And then they're like, oh, my gosh, it's June. And historically, a lot of therapists have said that June is not a good time to launch a practice and whatever. I want you to throw all of those myths out the window, right? On my show, sometimes I talk about the summertime slump and how it's really normal for us as therapists to see less clients in the summer, especially if you work with kids or teens or young adults who are off in the summer, who don't have as many eyes on them saying, hey, I think this kid is struggling, um, or just people go on vacation in the summer, right? But if you're graduating in May or you're starting in May and you're launching full steam ahead in June, look, private practices take time to build right? We're not expecting that within a week or even within a month or two that you're going to be totally full. So this can actually be a really great time to start your private practice because there's a lot of background noise that needs to happen before you ever see a client, right? You need to get business licenses. You need to make sure you have a website. You need to start doing some marketing. There's a lot of stuff you can do over the summer. And I'd really encourage you to take my private practice roadmap course. I try not to kind of sell my products too much on this podcast, But summer is a really good time to go through this course because it lays out that background stuff that you can do in your private practice before you ever see a client. You know, I would encourage you to start booking marketing meetings over the summer. I'd encourage you to start writing blog posts, to start a social media presence, to build your website. All of those things can be done in the very first few months. That doesn't mean you're not going to get clients in those first months, but I think it's a good place to start with just getting everything set up and established. So I would say if you're thinking about starting in the summer, go for it. There's no better time. There's no perfect time to open a private practice. The perfect time really is when you are feeling ready and confident in your ability to put yourself out there. 
I hope this helps. If you would like to be featured on Ask Kelly Anything, I love getting listener questions from you guys. Anything about private practice goes. And the best way to do that is actually just to give me a call and leave me a question on my voicemail. So I'm going to tell you the phone number right now and make sure to write it down. Here it is. 805-243-8241. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.